Um, just before we begin, I just wanted to mention that I recently contributed to a zine called After Prison, along with Rod Coronado, Jeff Lurz, and Josh Harper. So you can pick that up here. It's on a sliding scale of 2 to $5, and all the proceeds go to prisoner support. There's also some grand jury resistance resources that you can pick up, and those are free, and a bunch of my old support stuff that you can take as much as you want of, because I don't want it anymore. So, also before we begin, uh, here's a voicemail message that you never want to get. And if you can't hear it very well, the words will be on the screen. Well, I guess no one can hear it. So my name is Jordan Halliday. Uh, if you don't know about my case, a little bit about me. In 2008, I was approached by the FBI. They were investigating local animal liberation actions that had happened uh, in the area here in Utah under what is called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. I was a very avid animal rights activist at the time. I'd helped restart the Animal Defense League of Salt Lake City. Uh, did a lot of things such as um, you know, anti-vivisection anti demonstrations up at the U of U and multiple other campaigns. And my, my name was frequently in the newspaper, so it wasn't that big of a surprise to me when the FBI came and approached me at my work. A common tactic that the FBI does is when they have little to no evidence on underground actions, they'll tend to target above ground activists. So knowing this and also knowing my rights, I chose to resist. And in doing so, I ultimately was sentenced to 10 months in prison. Now, my case was super strange in that it was neither a misdemeanor nor a felony. It was something called sui generis, which is kind of this bottom of the barrel thing that they, they came up with. It's Latin for neither this nor that or something. And um, also, what was unique about my case is I'm only the third person in United States history to be charged the way I was charged. Um, I was charged both civilly and criminally for the same act of recalcitrance, for that same act of resisting. So flash forward to today, I am uh, now out of prison and I'm off of parole and I do freelance web design and graphic design and I host a podcast called Which Side? So if you're ever interested, you can check that out. Here's some support stuff. First question that people tend to ask me is, what is a grand jury? Well, in the federal legal system, the grand jury is used to decide whether someone should be charged for a serious crime. The grand jury hears evidence presented by the prosecutor, the U.S. attorney, and the grand jury uses subpoenas to gather this evidence. It can subpoena documents, physical evidence, and witnesses to testify. The special federal grand jury created in 1970 be used to investigate possible organized criminal activity rather than a specific crime. So here's what a typical grand jury subpoena looks like. As you can see, this one um, is a subpoena for a person and documents or objects. Oftentimes they will include an, an addendum or an attachment at the end which will ask you to bring specific items with you. And this can be anything from cell phone records to text messages to email messages. Um, Whatever they want, you have to bring it, and if you fail to do so, then you can be held in contempt of court. So how is a grand jury different than a trial jury? Well, unlike a petite jury, which is used to determine guilt in a trial, a grand jury consists of 16 to 23 jurors who are not screened for bias. The purpose of the grand jury is not to determine guilt or innocent, but to decide whether there's probable cause to prosecute someone for a felony crime. The grand jury operates in secrecy, and the normal rules of evidence do not apply. The prosecutor runs the proceedings and no judge is present. Defense lawyers are also not allowed to be present in the grand jury room and, cannot, and they cannot present evidence, but they may be available outside the room to consult with the witness. The prosecutor and the grand jury members may not reveal what occurred in the grand jury room and witnesses cannot obtain a transcript of their testimony. 
So how has a grand jury been misused? Well, because of their broad subpoena powers and secretive nature, grand juries have been used by the government to gather information on political movements and to disrupt those movements by causing fear and mistrust. The grand jury lends itself to being used for improper political investigation, <coughs> due in part to the prosecutor's ability to question witnesses without regard for rules that prohibit irrelevant, unreliable, or unlawfully obtained evidence. Those called before the grand jury may be compelled to answer any question, even those relating to lawful personal and political activities. That information has been used by the government as a basis to conduct further surveillance and disruption of political dissent. When used against political movements, the grand jury causes fear and mistrust because persons who refuse to answer questions about their First Amendment political activities, friends and associates, may be jailed for the life of the grand jury, up to 18 months. If a witness asserts her Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, she may be forced to accept immunity or go to jail for contempt. Even a witness who attempts to cooperate can be jailed if minor inconsistencies are found in her testimony. Such a perjury charge may stand even when the grand jury fails to hand down any indictment for what is, was ostensibly investigating. So those facts came from the Grand Jury Resistance Project, and I highly recommend that you check them out. They're a great resource for grand jury information as well as ways to resist. So how do we empower ourselves? Well, to understand the threat and power of a grand jury is to empower yourself. And if you can become empowered, you will not feel fear. And without the fear, the state and the abusive grand jury system cannot do anything to you. So grand juries are typically impaneled for two purposes, and that's indictment and investigation. Under indictment, 99% of the cases result in an indictment, which is a rubber stamp for the prosecutor. It's an often necessary step to go to criminal prosecution. An old lawyer's joke used to be that a grand jury could indict a sandwich if it wanted to. That's because in a grand jury, uh, there's no defense attorney allowed in the room, and you can basically be indicted for mere rumors, windows, and hearsay. In fact, in a recent WikiLeaks uh, document that was released, it stated that if you were the subject of a U.S. grand jury, you have a 99.97% chance of being indicted. Investigation. Prosecutor uses a grand jury as a fishing expedition to collect information, intimidate activists, and create distrust within the movement. When I was called before the grand jury, I was asked a lot of questions about myself, which were an obvious attempt to collect information on my community. I was asked about demonstrations that I'd organized. I was asked about whether or not I, dem I organized a demonstration that was occurring outside that grand jury room right at that moment that was in protest of the grand jury. Uh, I was asked about my friends, I was asked about my possible partners, uh, family that I might have. I was also asked if my sister was married to an animal rights activist. I was asked if I was vegan, if I was an atheist, if I was anarchist. All of these were an obvious attempt to paint a bad picture of me, to collect information, and uh, just harass and intimidate. So what makes up a grand jury? So there's 16 to 23 jurors, and they're not screened for bias. In my grand jury, they were seated like theater seating, classroom style seats, and they were all facing towards the middle. Uh, there were three, four people, and I was to the side of them, and to the side of me was the court reporter. In the middle of all of us was the prosecutor. So the grand jury can also ask questions. For me personally, they asked, where I bought my jacket, which was a stupid question that was just trying to confuse me. They usually meet weekly or monthly. Their terms can be extended, but most finish in less than 18 months. And this is done in complete secrecy. So what's wrong with the grand jury? Well, besides being hell of sketch, witnesses are often subpoenaed for their political beliefs. They don't have to tell you why you were called up, and anyone can be asked about anything. I've heard cases of people being asked what their favorite sexual position is, or whether or not they like the color blue. And this is all an obvious attempt to either confuse you, intimidate you, or to get you to answer some questions where you're not answering other questions. Two of your major constitutional rights are denied, and that's your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, you have to talk or you face contempt charges, and your Sixth Amendment right to counsel. The prosecutor can call up prosecution-friendly witnesses to make the people getting investigated look guilty, and there's no one to cross-examine them. You're not entitled to a defense attorney because it isn't a trial, and, it'll, and no defense attorney is allowed in the room 
However, in most cases, you can have one outside and go outside to consult with them before answering any question. For myself, I made sure to do this after every question that was asked of me, including my name and where I live. I wanted to make sure that I used my rights. By the time it got to the third grand jury, I was subpoenaed to three separate grand juries, I was already in prison and I was in shackles and I had the U.S. Marshal as my babysitter. And so to get them to have a lawyer-client privilege with me, it took about 30 minutes to drag me into the basement of the courthouse and have a personal conversation with my attorney. So the, the prosecutor was saying that I didn't have that right, and they might try to do something like that in saying that you don't have the right to meet with your attorney. Um, so you may, need to make sure that you use that right if you have it. Uh, for this third grand jury in particular, it was just taking way too long, and by the time it got to where I live, the prosecutor was so fed up that he just dismissed the whole grand jury. So, the normal rules of evidence do not apply. For example, hearsay evidence is allowed, and there is no double jeopardy protection. You can be subpoenaed for the same issue again after the grand jury's term expires. And that's what's really scary is that as long as they're investigating something and they're trying to indict someone for it, they can re-subpoena someone indefinitely for the rest of their life. And it's really scary because a lot of these crimes that they're trying to indict people for now don't have a statute of limitation because they add terrorism enhancements to them and stuff like that. So that's the freaky part. So how can we resist? Well, the obvious one is not to be around to get subpoenaed because you have to be physically served in the U.S. to be subpoenaed. Uh, this is obviously hard because you don't know when you're going to get subpoenaed in most cases. So, uh, to be subpoenaed, you have to be able to be identified by a U.S. Marshal or a federal agent, and they have to either, you, have, you can take the, the subpoena from them, and that's one way, or they can shove it in your face or throw it at your feet, and those are also legal ways of being served but they have to be able to identify you. I've heard of people leaving the US, maybe going to Canada or Mexico and hanging out for 18 months until the grand jury is over. Wow. But obviously, since it's hard to know when you're gonna get subpoenaed, the next best thing is if you get subpoenaed, you can just not show up for the grand jury. And now if I were to do things over again, this is what I would probably do. Because when I showed up and resisted, I ended up getting additional charges such as obstruction of justice. They tried to give me a terrorism enhancement, but that was dropped. Whereas if you don't show up, um, well, I'm not a lawyer and I can't say what can and cannot happen. Um, they were telling me, in my case, that I could have gotten just a failure to appear, which is a zero to six months, where my sentencing guideline was on the term of 10 to 16 months. You can also have a press conference outside the grand jury, and this is what I would have done um, as well. I wasn't the only person subpoenaed to my particular grand jury. There was another individual, and the night before, they called and asked me to take their name off of the statement, and so I don't believe that was ever released. And so what I ended up doing is showing up and reading a pre-written statement to the grand jury. And I think it was pretty effective because the grand jury did ask the prosecutor to step outside and that kind of irritated him. And so they were able to discuss it, but ultimately I still ended up being indicted. So your other option is lying and this is usually a bad idea. You have to be super wary of lying. A lot of people have been found not guilty of whatever they were originally charged with but found guilty of perjury for lying to a grand jury. Perjury, or lying under oath, is a felony. Obviously, I can't tell you what to do, but you can be a lot safer by just not talking. So what can happen? Well, the prosecutor may offer you something called use immunity. And this is where they promise not to use what you say against you. And by offer, I mean they give it to you. You have no choice in the matter. You can call this useless immunity, because they can use what you tell them to dig up more dirt on you and your friends. The prosecutor, the prosecutor can also use what you tell them to scare your friends into saying stuff about you because your friends think you sold them out when really you just gave a little information to the prosecutor. You also might get charged something called civil contempt. 
And you're more likely to get charged with civil contempt than with criminal contempt. And that's when the prosecutor puts you into jail to force you into cooperating. You can be in jail for two weeks to two months or longer, possibly the length of the grand jury. There's no set limit. Uh, your lawyer can help shorten this time. You can file something called a grumbles motion. And the basic idea of that is that as soon as it's clear that you're not going to talk no matter what, the judge has to let you out. They can't keep you in jail to punish you just to coerce you into cooperating. In my particular case, I tried to file a grumbles motion, but I was denied because the, prosec the judge determined that since I had faith that I was gonna get out on a grumbles motion, I wasn't being fully coerced. As weird as that is, so knowing my rights kind of fucked me. Oh, that's funny. So you can also get charged with something called criminal contempt. And this is super rare. And it's actually better in some ways. Since it's a criminal charge, you get all the legal protections of someone facing criminal charges. And by the time this is resolved, there's a good chance the grand jury will be over. You could, however, get convicted and spend time in jail. Now, upon release uh, uh, from, from jail for criminal contempt, I was also indicted with, or with civil contempt, I was also indicted with criminal contempt. And it was better in the sense that I had a lawyer, and they were able to knock down, they were trying to give me 16 or more months, and they were able to get it down to 10 months. But ultimately, I did still end up spending time. What does a contempt charge mean? Uh, contempt is basically just anything. Like, if, if you fail to cooperate, if you fail to bring in evidence, if you fail to so follow the orders. Of justice, or it's, it's, diff it's, it's different, yeah. They, they, they also charge me with obstruction of justice. But um, it's, it's usually within courtroom, and it's, it's usually when you aren't cooperating or you're not following the judge's order is the most common. You also have a chance of having nothing happen. And the best way to enable this to happen is to ensure that everyone is well informed about grand juries and that everyone is on the same page when it comes to resisting. The old saying that nobody talks, everybody walks is super applicable. Like I mentioned, in my case, I wasn't the only person indicted. There was another individual that was indicted, and they did choose to cooperate. And I feel that, although I would have probably been charged civilly still, that the reason why they were so harsh and charged me criminally was because of that cooperation. They first initially thought, well, if someone else is willing to cooperate, then we can coerce them into cooperating. And then when it was very apparent that I wasn't going to cooperate, uh, they got angry and decided to charge me criminally as well. So it's normal to be scared. You might also think, you know, what's the harm in testifying if you don't know anything? In my community here, locally, in the animal rights community, there were individuals that were even saying things like, well, you don't know anything, so what's the harm in testifying? In fact, they suggested that I testify because me not testifying would hinder support for people who actually committed crimes to that ended up in prison. So it hindered prisoner support, which is just, uh, it's not good thinking. <laughs> um, not only does it justify an invalid system, it also justifies information the prosecutor might be feeding to the grand jury that is untrue. And the, the biggest one is that it enables you to be put on a list of people that they know will talk. And we'll go into that. Uh, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of resisting? Well, one big advantage to resisting is that you're much less likely to be called before another grand jury. If they know that you're going to resist, they're less likely to subpoena you. It's also more difficult for them to put you in jail for civil contempt. Basically, the earlier that you start resisting, the better. If you cooperate, you may have to testify against your friends many times, and you might get prosecuted for perjury if you leave anything out. If you resist consistently, you may get charged with contempt, but you don't ever have to worry about getting a perjury charge, and you're much less likely to ever have to testify before a grand jury again. You protect yourself, your friends, and the movement you're a part of. During the days of the Weather Underground, a grand jury began investigating them in the Bay Area. 
Every witness read a short statement to the jury telling them that they wouldn't cooperate and why. The grand jury had to be canceled as a result. Jordan, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you read a pre-written statement as part of your resistance? I did, oh, okay. uh, and it's like I said, uh, the grand jury did ask the prosecutor to leave the room so they could discuss my statement, but I ultimately still ended up getting indicted. And, um, like I mentioned earlier, basically choosing to testify puts you on a list of people that they know will talk. It enables you to be approached by authority in the future and possibly be approached to provide extra information on your movement, as well as possibly being a plant or an informant for the movement that you're a part of, as well as getting subpoenaed again. Um, but the biggest thing is it's a violation of our basic civil and political rights, and it needs to be protested, resisted, and people need to be informed about it. We need to create a community and culture of resistance. The goal of a grand jury besides harassing and intimidating activists is to gather information on them, their friends, their family, and the community. So as a community, we should have a similar goal to gather information on the grand jury process. So we'll all be prepared to resist its abuse when an agent comes knocking. Another thing we should do is inform our non-activist friends, family, and coworkers. Help them to learn their rights. Ask them not to cooperate and to let you know if they are ever approached or contacted. For in the end, they are just as much a part of the community as we are. I know that's super hard. A lot of us here locally, um, we don't tend to get along with our parents a lot of times, especially uh, if you're raised in a religious household and you're not religious now. But it's very important um, to talk to your parents. And it could be something as simple as joking around. You're eating dinner at a table with your parents and you say something like, hey, mom and dad, you know that I'm a Leninist Marxist and you know that Sometimes we tend to get arrested, so if an FBI agent or a, or a police officer ever comes to the door, you know you don't have to talk, right? And, you know, it's, it's not entirely, like, straightforward, but you're at least planting a seed, and hopefully that seed will never have to grow into a tree where you have to see whether or not they learn from it. But it is important. And for myself, I, my family was approached by the FBI, and my coworkers were approached by the FBI. And I'm still guilty of not even talking to a lot of my coworkers about the situation. But it is something that you have to think about when you are a part of a social justice movement or activism in general. So if you are subpoenaed, you should lawyer up. You, you can call the National Lawyers Guild hotline, which is 888-NLG-ECOL, which is short for ECO Law. And there are a number of different committees and projects already set up for activists. There's animal rights, environmentalism, anarchists, and there's even an anonymous like internet activism committee that's already set up. So lawyers are an important part of a lot of people's legal strategy, and the NLG will help you find a radical lawyer almost anywhere in the US. But you have to be careful with lawyers, because some lawyers may give you terrible advice. Lawyers are trained to give the individual client the best defense, often at the expense of everyone else involved. Even political lawyers might not understand your goal is to defend the movement and your friends as well as yourself. So if your lawyer tells you to A, cooperate with a grand jury, B, testify against your friends or the movement, or C, cut off all contact with your friends and the movement, you need to change lawyers immediately. If you've received a subpoena or have been threatened to be subpoenaed by law enforcement recently, please let me know and I'll help you get in contact with someone who can help you. Also, recommend reading up. And there's tons of resources out there for learning about grand juries. You can check out the materials that I have here, um, as well as look online. I mentioned Grand Jury Resistance Project. There's also No Compromise, and that was one that I really went through when I was first subpoenaed. Green is the New Red's a great one, as well as the Civil Liberty Defense Center, and many more. When I was incarcerated, I read about the anti-war group, the Lexington Six, and what they said almost two decades ago uh, about grand jury resistance, I still feel really is really applicable still today. And that's that people must mobilize around these issues. To do this, people must first become familiar with grand jury and its abuses, publicizing the facts and educating others as to their rights. Secondly, it's important to engender in others a commitment to the resistance of these abuses, including but not limited to one's refusal to testify before the grand jury. 
Thirdly, it's necessary to keep in mind that while court battles can be fought and sometimes won, these abuses of the law are not abnormalities in a basically good system. They rather illustrate the true intentions of a bad system more openly and graphically than other insidious practices, and this should dominate our thinking as we organize. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah? Um, did you manage to contact the lawyer through that? Yeah, in fact, uh, that was the exact phone number that I called as soon as the FBI came into my work. Um, I called them. They didn't have anyone here locally, but they were actually able to find someone here locally in our community. And they're still a part of our community. They're actually a wobbly, super awesome person. Any other questions? Uh, they are an, they were an anti-war group that chose to uh, not cooperate with the grand jury. Uh, further information besides that, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Did your yeah. parents testify? Or did they like, communicate with the FBI? Or did my parents did, in fact, give the FBI my, my residence, and they said that I'm hanging out with some individuals that may be influencing me in a bad way and name some names, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyone else? Does, um, the grand jury is actually like, if your presentation pointed out that they have like a crazy amount of power. Um, but would you care or do you think it's relevant to your presentation to talk about how grand juries have actually worked in the other direction? In, in what way? Well, I mean, grand juries uh, sometimes, because they have this sort of unlimited power to um, investigate people, to call people into the courtroom, like say, for instance, when they were starting to um, go after all these communists and stuff like that mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s, they actually uh, turned it around on the investigating agencies like the Attorney General's office and the FBI and stuff like that and actually got them in some hot water um, because they would be all like, well, no, you guys have committed crimes because you guys are doing like um, all this illegal surveillance and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not saying that um, everything you're saying is absolutely correct and we should resist in all the ways and all this. I'm just saying like, do you think given in the future um, with all these issues around uh, anonymity or like protecting people's information on the internet, that grand jury trials could actually turn against like say for instance nefarious corporations and stuff? Well, personally, I don't think ever working within the system is the best way of doing things. So not this system. Not this system. So uh, I think it's it's sort of a mute point in my opinion. But um, as far as learning things from the grand jury, uh, now this, it doesn't really fall in line with what you're saying. But me going to the grand jury as opposed to not going, I learned what they're investigating. I, I learned about people that they were targeting in the community, and so that was that was an interesting thing which is kind of the reverse of what they were going for. But uh, to kind of answer your question in a roundabout way. It, it does. Like, yeah. It should make it clear. I was not being all like, we should keep it around or anything. Yeah. Just, uh, I figured we could have a little question to, to sort of diversify the conversation. About. Yeah, for sure. Uh, have there been any other uh, attempts to re-subpoena you, or have you had any further ongoing conflicts with the FBI or anything after this? Luckily not. Um, in fact, my, my lawyer just wrote me yesterday, and they told me that the they recently met with the prosecutor, and they asked about me, and that they wish me the best of luck for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I guess there's no ill will. <laughs> but <laughs> I, 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 they, they, they did, um, they did end up indicting two individuals in this case. So um, I, I don't really feel that this that investigation is relevant anymore. Any other questions? So when they talk to you and like a number of other people in your circles, you know uh, they actually approached me and just another individual, and that was the current wife of one of the people that they indicted. Mm. Two quick questions. Uh -huh. uh, first, um, it sounds as though there is no limits as to what they can collect as evidence. With their own. Yeah, they, they actually have no, no, um, 
kind of no, yeah, no form of like the, the, no defense attorneys allowed in there, so they can collect as much evidence as they want. Like I said, they've asked questions like what your favorite sexual position is, and most of the time that isn't information that they necessarily want to collect. But they're trying to intimidate you or get you to answer some questions where you wouldn't answer others. But they can ask you whatever. They can ask you what if if you know Joe, and then answering a seemingly innocent question like that may give valid may give validity to other things that were mentioned while you're not in the room and showing a connection to evidence that you might not have seen. So it's it's just safer to. Just shut your mouth. <laughs> so they try to get you to bring your own evidence, like you said, you have to bring your own. Yeah, they 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 call you essentially. They're calling you like as a witness. Uh, however, there's no judge and there's no defense attorney, so it's a very one-sided conversation. And anything that you don't answer, if you don't answer any question, then you can be held in contempt of court, and you don't have your Fifth Amendment right, and you don't have your Sixth Amendment right. So really, really, you have to answer everything that's asked of you. Otherwise, you face contempt. So if they wanted you to bring your choice of dog food, you know, you'd have to bring it. Yeah, essentially. And they can, they can ask you to bring evidence that you might not have. They can ask you to bring cell phone text messages that you might have deleted from your phone or something like that. Uh, in my case, they actually tapped my phone before any crimes had occurred. So they had all that information. I didn't have to bring anything. But um, The second question. They allow you an opportunity to talk with the grand jurors, um, but that's, that's up to the prosecutor's oh, okay. de decision. And, um, but yeah, if you wanted to ask them questions, you don't have to necessarily answer their questions directly. If they ask you what your name is, you can say, why the hell am I here? You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I would highly hope that they wouldn't say that's contempt for asking a question, but they might. <laughs> yes. um, what was like, the support from the outside like while you were on trial and, um, and like, serving your sentence? And like, where did a lot of it come from? Uh, I did have a lot of local support initially. And that was mainly from like the anarchist circles as well as uh, animal rights circles, stuff like that, uh, movements that I was a part of. And that extended nationally. And pretty much local support died down a little bit when. Um, Does it explain that it was two separate? Yeah, I, I had two separate incidences. Um, I, like I said, I was charged civilly and I was charged criminally. When I was charged civilly, I had a ton of support. But when I came out and I was pissed off that someone snitched, I didn't shut my mouth about it. And People were friends of the person that snitched, and just the local uh, drama that's associated with calling someone out. So, yeah. Are there any like abolished grand jury organizations in Utah? Uh, in Utah, not that I'm aware of. There are definitely a ton of organizations. The Bay Area has one. Um, also, I mentioned Grand Jury Resistance Project. They're definitely one. I think they recently started one in New York for Jerry Koch, who is a grand jury resistor up there. The Midwest had some resistance projects when they had some activists out there. Had the committee to stop FBI repression. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was one of them for sure. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, when you're called in for a grand jury, was, was it a state or was it a federal grand jury? It's federal. It was a federal? Mm -hmm. um, from what I understand, when it's even more stacked than that, than with the grand jury selection, because a lot of the pool that they take from are people from like the sort of DC area, the, like a lot of people who are like, say, for instance, governmental <laughs> workers, and so the people sitting on your trial are like, you know, say, for instance, somebody who normally works for the FBI yeah. or whatever. Well, to my understanding, I th I think they still pull people locally, uh, like they would a normal jury trial, but it is extremely biased and. Um, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if they can choose what people they want to be. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm not saying they like, actually like, choose the people mm -hmm. and get to filter them. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is, since they do get to draw from a pool, and a lot of those oh, yeah. people live in the DC area, it's all like you could even have somebody who like, even works for the you know, attorney's office or, or whatever. And, 
And that's what's scary is that there's no defense attorney. In a normal, in a normal tr trial jury, your defense attorney will say they will nix certain people on the jury that they don't want. And the, defense, the, the prosecutor will also cut people that they don't want. So it's more of a balanced selection of peers. But in the grand jury, it's whatever the prosecutor wants. So if he sees somebody who used to be on the FBI, he might be like, hey, I want you. For sure, for sure. Anyone else? Okay. Sweet. Well, well thanks, everybody. I'll throw these over here.